Hello everybody, welcome back. This will be case study number 18, joint pain in a young adult. This will be interesting. We don't get a lot of young people coming in with chronic joint pain. Usually they're a little older. All right, uh, if you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the i button in the upper right hand corner. I really appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. Uh, you know, I always, I, I keep my videos free for everybody because I know a lot of you are unable to donate. I used to be a medical student at one time too. So I really appreciate everyone and your consideration. And now let's get on to the fun stuff. All right, we got a 25-year-old guy coming into the clinic complaining of mild and persistent joint pain for the last five years. So this is ongoing. He says that he's now coming in because it seems to be worsening and he wants a diagnosis before he ages off his parents' health insurance plan next year. Good old USA, right? The pain is worse in his lower back and hips and seems worse in the morning and improves with activity throughout the day. The pain does not radiate anywhere, probably not neurological. He just graduated from law school and is working a desk job, which has made his pain harder to tolerate. He endorses some fatigue, but review of systems is otherwise unremarkable. He says that he drinks two to three alcoholic beverages per week, doesn't smoke, occasional cannabis use. He has been sexually active with both men and women and says that he does not consistently use protection, but he has not had sex in over a year and has been tested for STD since then. He has no significant past medical history. Family history is non-contributory. He's not on any medications and vitals are within normal limits. All right, what do we want to do for a physical exam for this guy? The important thing is that you make sure and do your spinal exam. Uh, because this is a joint issue, we want to make sure and do our spine and extremities examination, which should be grouped together on CCS. So what we find is a very normal exam with the exception of the spine and extremities. We see mild tenderness of the sacroiliac joint bilaterally, a loss of lumbar lordosis. You gotta be really, really, really keen to see that. And neurologically, no focal sign sensations intact, deep tendon reflexes are intact, normal strength. So really just some joint and um, orthopedic issues going on here. All right, so what is our differential? Well, when you got a young person coming in with joint pain, the big thing you want to think of are these this class of of uh, of rheumatologic disorders known known as seronegative spondyloarthropathies. That's a big word, isn't it? Uh, so the number one thing that we think of in a young male is ankylosing spondylitis, but there are a number of other things. Reactive arthritis, also known as Rider syndrome. We don't call it that anymore because Herr Rider was a naughty boy at Buchenwald concentration camp. Um, psoriatic arthritis is a possibility, usually in older people. Rheumatoid arthritis and malignancy with vertebral neoplasm. All right, so our initial workup. Anytime you've got joint pain or in one area, what you want to do is you want to take a picture of that area, an x-ray, uh, and then do one joint proximal and one joint distal. It's a good rule of thumb. So we want to get an x-ray of the lumbar spine and an x-ray of the pelvis. Um, we're going to get a SED rate because this is probably inflammatory. We want a CBC and a BMP, and then we want a rheumatoid factor because there's a possibility of rheumatoid arthritis. And what do we find? Well, you're going to see the plain films. The SED rate is high at 81. The CBC BMP are within normal limits, and the rheumatoid factor is negative, which pretty much rules out RA. So what do we see on our plain films? What are you supposed to see here? Normally, right about here, you would see a nice clear joint space. And this is the sacroiliac joint. So when you don't see that space, what you're dealing with here is something called sacroiliitis. I think I'm spelling this right. Sacroiliitis. Now, what do we see over here? This is the classic bamboo spine. Now, you're not gonna see this in everyone with this diagnosis, but it is very, very specific. Okay. So the diagnosis here is ankylosing spondylitis. And we know that based on the patient's presentation, his gender is very contributory to that, and also um, the plain film findings. 
So the best initial diagnostic test to diagnose ankylosing spondylitis when you have clinical suspicion is the pelvic x-ray. It's the best initial diagnostic test. When you have consistent findings, sacroiliitis, bamboo spine, that confirms the diagnosis. Now, if you get your plain films and you don't see those things and you don't know because the x-ray doesn't really tell you, uh, then what you need to do is you need to go ahead and get an MRI. And what you'll see is edema and swelling, and uh, that would be consistent as well with the diagnosis. And typically, you'll see the MRI findings earlier on in the course of the illness. If the MRI is equivocal, then you'll get HLA B27 antigen testing. Now, a lot of students think, well, I should just get HLA B27, right? Because that's going to be positive in everybody who's got ankylosing spondylitis. And that's not really true. And also about 10% of people with no disease will have HLA B27 antigen. So it is something that we do kind of as a last resort for diagnosis. The treatment uh, is NSAIDs. So fairly straightforward. Okay. Uh, ibuprofen. Now, some people don't respond to that. And a big reason that people don't respond to that is inadequate dosage. So you give them NSAIDs. If it doesn't work, you may titrate the dose up. Now, if that doesn't work, then the second line is the TNF inhibitors. So infliximab, adalimumab, that's uh, Remicade and Humira. That's going to be not something you'll be giving on CCS, but it is something that the rheumatologist will deal with. And if that doesn't work, then you'll use secukinumab, which is an IL-16 inhibitor, also known as Cosentix. Now, what you're not going to do is you're not going to give steroids, and uh, rarely will you give methotrexate. They just don't work. Methotrexate tends to be good for peripheral disease. Now, women who have ankylosing spondylitis are more likely to have peripheral joint involvement. But if there's no peripheral joint involvement, we do not give methotrexate. So psoriatic arthritis, we can give methotrexate. Rheumatoid arthritis, we can give methotrexate. It involves the hands. Ankylosing spondylitis, unless it's involving peripheral joints, we do not give methotrexate. If there's spinal tenderness, you want to make sure you get an x-ray of the spine because spinal fractures are a complication. And then we want to make sure that we're doing our proper referrals, sending, it off, sending them off to rheumatology for ongoing management, physical therapy for symptomatic management. And if there are ocular symptoms, iritis, anterior uveitis, stuff like that, we will send them off to ophthalmology for a, an assessment. So ankylosing spondylitis is a seronegative spondyloarthropathy that usually presents in young men, teens, early 20s, but it can really present at any age. It tends to be in men, which is unusual because typically when we see these autoimmune disorders, they tend to be in women. There's about a two or three to one predilection for men. So that's unusual. It classically manifests as lower back stiffness that's worse in the morning. Just like all these autoimmune disorders, they tend to be worse in the morning. Often you'll see a loss of lumbar uh, lordosis. That indicates a more advanced disease. Um, so seronegative spondyloarthropathies share several common features. Number one, they're RF negative, rheumatoid factor negative. That's why they're called seronegative. They tend to have a predilection for the spine. The sacroiliac joint is commonly involved, and there's an association with this HLA B27 antigen. There are four uh, seronegative spondyloarthropathies that are common, ankylosing spondylitis, reactive arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, and juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Even though it's got the name rheumatoid arthritis uh, in it, it is actually RF negative. The complications of ankylosing spondylitis include anterior uveitis or iritis. Uh, so think of that when you've got ocular pain, photophobia, stuff like that. Spinal fractures mentioned, restrictive lung disease due to immobility of the ribs. You can get aortitis, which can lead to aortic regurgitation and heart failure. So you've got to make sure that you're listening to these patients' heart. Rheumatologists will be doing that. And then third degree heart block. So what are our differentials? Well, we got reactive arthritis, also known as Reiter syndrome. Look for a history of non-gonococcal urethritis, chlamydia, or a GI infection, salmonella, campy, uh, you see it occasionally, Klebsiella, pneumonia can do it too. Um, this will often be in a younger person, but not always. It's really important you keep this in mind because not all men, particularly men, show symptoms of chlamydia. So you've got to keep this in mind. 
Arthritis uh, can be in a variety of different patterns. One of the things that really tips you off to reactive arthritis, but it's certainly not always there, is something called keratoderma blenorragicum. And it's a kind of a pustular rash that has a tendency to show up in the hands and feet. It's characteristic, but it's not always seen. Reactive arthritis, constitutional symptoms are commonly present. The maxim for reactive arthritis, can't see, can't pee, can't climb a tree. All right, psoriatic arthritis tends to be in the hands. They often get that psoriatic rash. So dactylitis, nail pitting, tends to involve the distal interphalangeal joints and usually older onset here. So thinking... 35 to 45. I just turned 35 today. Uh, so I guess I'm in that range. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, this is always going to be rheumatoid factor positive, tends to be in women, younger, middle-aged, uh, affects several joints. Usually it's more peripheral, think hands and fingers, and it's multi-systemic. And then malignancy with vertebral neoplasm, think of signs consistent with Malignancy, one of the common, um, one of the common uh, malignancies that spread to the vertebrae, of course, is prostate cancer, so older men. So to recap, ankylosing spondylitis is a seronegative spondyloarthropathy that usually presents in young men, classically manifesting as lower back stiffness that's worse in the morning. To diagnose this, you will confirm it with pelvic x-ray based on your clinical findings, as is the best initial test. You get an MRI if the x-ray is clean. MRI is the most accurate test. The management first line is NSAIDs. Classically, ankylosing spondylitis uh, responds really well to NSAIDs. If it doesn't, go for the anti-TNF drugs. You'll refer the patient to rheumatology for ongoing care, physical therapy for their symptoms, and ophthalmology if there are ocular symptoms present. Do not use steroids or methotrexate. They don't work. The only time you're going to use methotrexate is if there's peripheral joint involvement. The complications include anterior uveitis and aortic disease, and there are a few others, namely spinal fractures.